Welcome to Ocast by O House, a podcast where we discuss topics related to everything in the O House world, from new and existing products to application stories from relevant industries. I'm your host, Eric Hall. Today we'll be speaking with Tim Roberts, Territory Manager at Country Malt Group in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Delaware, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Country Malt Group provides a diverse range of malt products and services to brewers and distillers around the world. Tim has over 20 years experience in the brewing industry. Previously, he was head brewer for 11 years at Yards Brewing Company. And prior to that, he was head brewer at various other brew pubs in Pennsylvania. So I'd like to thank Tim for joining us today. Tim, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the Country Malt Group's uh, motto is to inspire your best craft. And I was just wondering, uh, what, what inspired you to get into the beer business? Well, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, I mean, I, I found myself in, you know, I graduated in college in 95 and I was kind of an early adopter. Just, you know, that was fairly, you know, the early days of craft beer. I just found out I really liked it. And, um, you know, I, in, in a way, I didn't know what I was going to get into, but I was interested by the whole I don't know, scene of it all, and I didn't know what I wanted to do otherwise. So, you know, in some ways I fell into it, but I really enjoy sort of the variety of the job where it's a lot of different kinds of, um, you know, roles. And you have, you have a science role, and there's obviously chemistry involved and physics and fluid dynamics and all that stuff. And then, of course, you have creativity and crafting recipes, and you have, um, and then you have sort of, you know, this interesting group of people, which to me is the best part of it. And, and it's sort of what's kept me in the industry for 20 years where, you know, it, everyone comes at it from a different kind of direction. And that 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 really keeps it interesting with a, a really a nice, diverse group of people. Uh, do, you, do you find that that's uh, maybe surprising to people how, how diverse an industry it is? Because a lot of it seems so sort of grassroots. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something that, in, in especially in recent months, sort of the industry has actually grappled, grappled with in terms of diversity, in terms of, you know, ethnic background and, and inclusion for women and stuff like that. I think we're going in the right direction in, in both those fronts. But when I'm talking about diversity in people, it's not, you know, very few people in my industry, you know, were 18 year olds headed to college that wanted to become a brewer. You know, it almost, it barely existed when I was 18 anyways. And it's still not such a straightforward path as, say, being a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. So I think you get people that are sort of come at it in, a, in different directions that have different kind of interests and different passions, but all commonly have a, a passion for beer and brewing and stuff that sort of creates camaraderie. And, you know, it's almost like a tribe brewers. So it's one of the things I like about the industry for sure. How widely do the ingredients and, and the actual process of brewing a beer, how does it change from, from one style to another? I would say almost the ingredients probably change more from style to style. There is obviously processing differences, probably the biggest one being, you know, the temperature of fermentation between lagers and ales. But other than that, it's sort of the, you know, the inputs sort of affect every aspect of the beer. You know, almost all the, all the color from beer, for example, comes from the kilning of the malts. The strength of the beer comes from how much malt you put in, you know, how, how strong it is. Uh, you know, how strong your fermentation is. Uh, the yeast affects the flavor, of course, because it, it produces esters as it, as it metabolizes alcohol or it metabolizes sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide. And then sort of the big darling of, you know, and well, and then you have the unsung hero, of course, is, which is water. And, you know, the water chemistry is important and you're adding brewing salts and sometimes you're softening the water and sometimes you're using RO even just to sort of take it down to nothing because the water most certainly affects both the the yeast health and as well as the mouthfeel for sure. Um, and it's sort of the darling of, of beer, at least in the United States right now, is hops. And so hops basically do two things to beer, is they bitter beer and they add aroma. So bitterness is bitterness, and so they all kind of do that. That's less interesting. But aroma people, I think they say they can, they can, they can um, detect something like 6,000 distinct aromas and so that that's a big thing with the, sort of the fruitiness of hops you know where they can smell like pine needles or they can smell like pineapples or they can smell more earthy or spicy and so um 
to me, the, yeah, that that's really the, the sort of what what a brewer does a lot is manipulate those ingredients in terms of um, how they're added, when they're added, what where they where they're coming from, and it's uh, I always say it's sort of one of the big differences between beer and wine is that brewers manipulate stuff more than winemakers who really just take the grape juice, of course, and, and ferment it, whether it's fermented with wild or yeast that's on the grape uh, itself or whether they pitch the yeast. Um, you know, Ohaus uh, recently introduced the, the Aqua Searcher line of, of benchtop pH meters. And I was just curious, how much do pH levels affect the, the taste of beer? It, it's, it's huge in brewing. And I, I would say it's one of the top three kind of measurements. The other one being um, temperature and, and sugar concentration for brewers. It, it's almost the first sort of lab piece of ingredient that any brewer would, would buy. And it, it sort of goes from start to finish. And, and you know, just to kind of hit the highlights, the first one would be the pH of your incoming water, which can affect, um, for example, how the mouthfeel and the mash, and it can also affect how tannins are extracted during loudering. Um, you, you, and then the next step would be the mash, which, you know, it has very, very strong uh, buffers. But if you're outside of the range of about 5.2 to 5.4, you know something's wrong in your process or <laughs> something's wrong in your measurement, of course. Um, during the boil, the, the, the pH of, of the wort now, which is the liquid, uh, starts to drop. And if you're not seeing that drop again, you, you know there's something wrong in your process. And then I, I probably... The the biggest thing really is that the fermentation creates acid, and so your pH is going to drop during fermentation, and that that's a big red flag. If your pH is not dropping, then you have something desperately wrong uh, going on with your fermentation, which will of course affect the finished beer, no doubt about it. And if and it's sort of my contention, and, and maybe sort of a good rule of thumb is that if your beer doesn't approach 4.0 uh, when it's finished and in package, it sort of tastes um, flabby or insipid and flat. It, it doesn't have that sparkle that really high quality beer uh, does. And, and then after you're done with fermentation and the beer should be done, there's, uh, brewers can of course manipulate by adding acid, uh, usually phosphoric or lacta, to drop the pH for specialty styles such as Berliner Weiss. And then I would say, I guess, lastly, is if your pH continues to drop, well, then you have you know, arguably the worst problem of all is that you have uh, acid creating um, bacteria, most likely lactobacillus, which is um, sort of latched on and, and is eating at the sugars that yeast can't naturally metabolize. Um, so do water analysis meters come in, would you say, pretty early in the process to let you know if you're heading in the right direction or, or is it later? No, it's only early, I would argue, because once once you mix the, the water with the barley or the malt, right, um, then it's no longer water. And so we're sort of looking at other things. But in general, all of it's important. You know, the bicarbonate level is important. Probably most of all is pH, as I said, with water. But also secondarily, the total hardness is very, very important in terms of typically in terms of calcium and magnesium. Um, all of that affects the mouthfeel for sure and also affects the yeast health in that most municipal water supplies are calcium deficient deficient and so most often brewers will add some salts to in the process because yeast needs about at least 120 parts per million in, in terms of calcium concentration does where the beer is brewed have any effect uh, you know in terms of the water you know people always talk about you know, like New York water is why the bagels and pizza are so good. Is that is that a myth or is there actually some truth to that? No, it's it's 100 percent true. And in fact, all of the great brewing places in the world, the historical places in the world sort of grew up around their water supply or, or maybe maybe more to a better point, their beer styles grew up around the types of water they had. And so the best two examples are pills and you know, in the Czech Republic and is obviously famous for Pilsners, which are our most, uh, are, are best brewed with very, very soft water. And sure enough, the water in Pilsen averages about seven parts per million total hardness. Whereas uh, Burton on Trent, which is in England, it's not as well known, but it's, it's where pale ales got their start. Uh, and the hardness brings out the nice hop character of, of or the character of hops. And so that water is, in fact, over 400 parts per million. So that's obviously a huge range, and I think that's really interesting. I think that's a good example of how it affects how it affects the flavor of beer, just like the water in New York City makes great bagels. 
And in fact, a lot of brewers, especially when they're going to another location, will will install full-on uh, reverse osmosis systems in order to take the water down to nothing at all. So that, that gives them the sort of the, the ability to add whatever kinds of salts and minerals they want back into the water and so that they can flavor match other, either other locations or, you know, or water profiles that interest them. Um, you know, obviously one of our interests here is the, the idea of lab equipment being used outside the lab in other ways or, or, or the, the definition of lab maybe being expanded. What other kind of, of quote unquote lab equipment do you use in the brewing process uh, at any stage of the process? It's sort of endless, and and I think craft brewing, which is is my segment, is sort of getting more into it as the industry exploded. Because um, you know, there's there's expense to lab equipment, of course, but then there's also I think there's a growing attention to detail, and I think analytical equipment is very important to that. So obviously, we we talked quite a bit about pH. I think temperature is pretty straightforward, but I think it's also not to be discounted as maybe the most crucial parameter in, in processing beer. I mean, you have the temperature of the mash, you have the boil, and of course it's above uh, 212 Fahrenheit because it's a sugar solution. And then, and probably most crucially, you have fermentation temperatures, which are, you know, which are very detailed and make a huge difference in the final flavor of the beer. I would say the next uh, level of lab equipment, if you want to call it that, and in breweries, it's a lot of handheld stuff. I don't, you know, I don't know how you want to categorize that, but it's analytical equipment is, is I guess, how I would say it, is um, a way to measure CO2. It's, um, it's also very, very important, and, and you, want to, you want to have something that's more reliable than your taste buds. And then beyond that, I mean, it, it's fairly, you know, limitless. Of course, there's microscopes because you want to know how many cells you're pitching into your fermentation. On that front, there's also salometers, which um, not only count cells, but then they also uh, calculate viability and, and um uh, and just you know just how healthy your your yeast is there's of course old-fashioned plating going on to make sure that you don't have anything any wild yeast or bacteria growing in your beer as you could imagine alcohol measurements beyond a simple simple calculation are very very important uh in the field right now or in the in the segment right now pcr testing is just sort of uh, I don't know, found more of a home in craft brewing because of the quick, quick results that you can get prior to packaging. And then also um, you're, you're often measuring dissolved nitrogen, which for the, you know, the nitrogenated beers like Guinness and stuff like that, that's an important value. And then, you know, me, you know, going back is, is one of the primary values for packaged beers is dissolved oxygen, which brewers uh, measure in parts per billion. And the deal is that if you have dissolved oxygen in your packaged beer, it's going to, it promotes staling and it's going to start to taste like cardboard and it's going to limit hop aroma. And so that's a really crucial value as well. Tim, my last question is, um, is there anything that you're, you're currently working on? Is there like a, a new frontier that you're, you're looking to conquer in the brewing business? I don't know about a new frontier, but I was a brewer for about 21 years, both in the pub and the uh, production environment. And so when I started on the supplier side, which is relatively typical for someone um, someone with a work history like mine, um, to me, the biggest part of it is education. And I, that's something that I'm pretty passionate about. And it gives me the opportunity to help a lot of the younger brewers. And even going into my current position, I had always kind of wanted to parlay it into, ter into some kind of technical advice or help for all these brewers around the country that are sort of just getting started. And, and, and that that's really near and dear to my heart. Are, are there brewing like uh, programs? I'm just, just curious. We don't even have to use this, but I was just curious. Are there like things that people can get into when they want to get into this line of work? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we, so when I started in the late 90s, there were a couple very, very famous brewing schools around the world, most notably in Scotland and Germany, of course, as you'd, as you'd imagine. Um, and then there was a couple good ones in the U.S., uh, most notably, I would say, the UC Davis. And then there was a shorter program in, at the Siebel Institute in Chicago. But I would say in the past decade or so, it's really exploded where – I don't have a number, but I would say there's probably something along the lines of 200, 250 brewing diploma courses, which are meant for, you know, mostly education for the theory, but also hoping to groom people for the industry as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
For more information, visit our website, ohouse.com, O-H-A-U-S, to view and download more information about the products we featured in today's episode. All of these products are available for purchase by contacting your regional Ohouse representative. I want to again thank our guest, Tim Roberts, for joining us today. And thank you for taking the time to learn more about Ohouse. This has been an episode of Ocast with Eric Hall, and I look forward to having you back for our next episode.